Yeah. <laughs> okay, so your dream life, no limits, anything you wanted, what would it be? Um, probably to win the lottery, um, own, a, own some big property, start a business. What's your dream life if you could have anything you wanted, no limits, what would that look like? It would be a big house with a lot of green and a swimming pool and it would be in a nice neighborhood and uh, it would be peaceful and the sun would be very bright. My dream life is to uh, get out of Worcester, maybe go up to Maine, go live in a nice lake house up there and uh, just relax and just take it easy for the rest of my life and no worries. That's it. Cash. Cash. A few houses and a few girls. I'm not even going to lie. And I like to buy my mama a house and my family. And I just would like a lot of money because money will change your life. My dream life would be if someone paid me to travel around the world. So my dream life, a big house, every car I want. A uh, nice family, um, a, a good job, and all the friends and family in the world. That's How perfect. How much money? How much money? Yeah. All yeah, the money I can get. Out. All the money in the world. All of it. It's a hard question. Yeah. Yeah, I would. Some, some, some type of star, you know, a movie actor or something like that. Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. I just want a billion dollars. After that, I'll take care of the rest. My dream life, um, probably live in maybe a 4,000 square foot log cabin in the, out in the wilderness somewhere, maybe in Montana or something like that. Mm -hmm. Fish, hunt every day, mm -hmm. no work. No work. You know, so hang out, hang out with my children and that, that's, you know, that's about it. Okay. I think it would be a lot of nothing. I think it would be a lot of sitting around, um, easy. Easy, carefree. My dream life, literally like a big apartment, seeing over the city. A nice car, quiet life, pretty much. Quiet life, that's all, nothing mm -hmm. else. Relaxing. Whenever we think about what a great life would look like, we tend to have some recurring ideas. We think that a wonderful life would involve lots of money, big houses, fame, success, nice cars, no adversity, no pain, little or no work, and few responsibilities. If we could sum it all up in a sentence, it's that we think a wonderful life would be an easy life. Therefore, we think that the best life that we could live would be the easiest life that we could live. So that's what most of us spend our lives striving for. More wealth, more stuff, more ease. And we judge the success of a life by how much of those things a person has. But I want us to think in a little more depth about this. Does a wonderful life really mean an easy life? Well, to answer this question, let's look at some wonderful lives from history. Now you're going to have some inspirational figures of your own, but I'm just going to give you a few of my personal favorites. One of the most inspirational lives I can think of is that of William Wilberforce. Wilberforce was the driving force behind the abolition of the human slave trade in the British Empire, and it was because he spent his life for that cause that he saved countless human souls from the misery of slavery from that time in the early 1800s until today. Now, I think the ending of slavery was a wonderful use of a life. That was a life well lived. But what did that life actually involve? Well, it didn't involve much ease. In fact, quite the opposite. The ship owners, slave traders and the plantation owners hated Wilberforce because his campaigning threatened their income and livelihoods. Government ministers hated him too because it was thought that the economy of the British Empire wouldn't be able to survive without slavery. They thought that he was putting the whole nation in jeopardy. So Wilberforce spent years and years being a lone voice in a sea of opposition in Parliament. He was shouted down during his speeches, his friends turned on him, and he was even accused of sedition. He had health problems too, namely with his eyesight and then later with colitis. Throughout these years of struggle, which lasted over a quarter of a century, most of his adult life, he often battled with feelings of failure because he didn't seem to be making much progress. Yet, we look at his struggle now, the hardship and the pain, the opposition, the illness, the self-doubt, and conclude that he couldn't have lived his life any better. Why? Not because it was easy, but because he spent it in a worthy cause that ultimately made life better for millions. Coming from Scotland, one of our national heroes at home is William Wallace. 
Wallace was the Scottish patriot who stood up to the English tyranny of King Edward I in the 13th century. Edward was known as the Hammer of the Scots because of his brutal dealings with the Scottish people, but because of the bravery and patriotism of William Wallace, he helped inspire a whole nation to fight for and win their freedom. The ideas that came out of that struggle helped form the basis of democracy in the entire Western world. But was Wallace's a life of comfort and ease? Not at all. He faced danger often, was betrayed, often outnumbered, he lost people close to him, tasted defeat frequently, and in the end he had his life cut short by the most brutal form of execution we can imagine. He was just 35 years old when he died, but it's a life that has inspired for over 800 years. His life wasn't easy, but it was spent in a worthy cause, and he helped win a nation their freedom. As such, it's a life that is still talked about today. Let's go even further back in time now and think of Jesus' disciples. I'm sure everyone would agree that they had wonderful, inspirational, amazing lives and that they couldn't have lived them any better. Because of their commitment and obedience to the words of Christ, they changed the face of the world. And for over 2,000 years, their words and deeds have been read about, talked about, studied, and held up as examples for the rest of humanity to follow. But none of them had an easy time. All of them suffered near constant persecution, hatred, and suffering for the message that they brought to the world. Indeed, all of Jesus' disciples, except for one, would die a martyr's death. They didn't have easy lives, but they did have wonderful lives. Why? Because they were spent in a worthy cause. And finally, what about the most wonderful, inspirational, amazing life of them all? The life of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He revolutionized the world, taught people how to find eternal salvation, and touched more lives on this planet than can be counted. In fact, he is the very center of all history. H.G. Wells wrote, I am an historian, I am not a believer, but I must confess as an historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all history. Kenneth Scott Latourette said, as the centuries pass, the evidence is accumulating that, measured by his effect on history, Jesus is the most influential life ever lived on this planet. Jesus Christ is so influential that we even measure today's date by his birth. His teachings form the foundation of civilization. But was this greatest of lies an easy one? No, it wasn't. From humble beginnings, he was rejected, mocked, hated, betrayed by friends, spat on, falsely accused, crucified, and laid in a borrowed grave. But there has been no more inspirational or wonderful life in the history of the world. It was wonderful, not because it was easy, but because it had been spent in the worthiest of causes. We could go on and on, but the point is simply this. Every single life that has been well lived, every life that we would consider to be wonderful or inspirational or to have extra significance beyond the person's own lifetime, has not only not been easy, they've been extremely difficult. And they've been difficult because they've been spent in a worthy cause. The fight has been part of the process. And indeed, the struggle is what gave these lives their grandeur and significance and wonder. It's because abolishing slavery was difficult and involved a long struggle that we find Wilberforce to be so inspirational today. It's because fighting the odds was difficult that we find Wallace to be inspirational. It's because spreading the gospel was difficult that we find the disciples to be inspirational. It's because Jesus died on a cross for our sins that we find him to be so awe-inspiring. These are people who saw what needed to be done, saw that it was difficult, saw that it would cost them something, maybe even their lives, but who did it anyway. And that's why they're heroes. That's why they're inspirational. So you see, a wonderful life is never an easy life. A life of ease is actually forgettable and wasted. You have one shot at this life to make it count for something. And if you were to spend it chasing money, cars, houses, fame and easy living like most people are, 
you would die having never really lived. Spending every day on a hammock on the beach isn't a great life, it's a wasted life. And yet that's where many of us are today, even as Christians. The materialism that dominates the minds of unbelievers dominates ours too. We're trying to store up riches on earth, we're trying to accumulate more and more stuff, and above all, we're looking for security and comfort and a life of ease. And yet the Bible tells us that we're not called to any of that. We're not called to comfort at all. We're called to live for something much more. We're called to danger, to speak out when no one else will, and to put our lives on the line for the sake of the kingdom. We're called to adventure, to go to places that no one wants to go, to reach the lost, the hurting and the broken. We're called to risk, to put ourselves in places where we need God to come through for us because we know that if he doesn't, we have no hope. We're called to preach the gospel, heal the sick and cast out demons, to pick up our cross counting everything that we once loved, everything that we once held dear, everything that we once built our lives upon, all our money, our success, our comfort, our security, our fame, counting it all as complete garbage compared to the pursuit of our Lord Jesus Christ and his glory. We're called to fight the good fight, change lives, change worlds, liberate slaves, and to die to our very selves, knowing that it's no longer us who lives, but Christ who lives within us. We are called to shun comfort. Comfort is actually our enemy. It will nullify your life because you'll come to love it. And instead of searching out the hard things, the difficult things, the worthy things, the dangerous things, the world changing things, the life changing things, counting the cost and then doing them anyway, like the greats of the past, you'll be neutralized and become content with mere wealth and stuff and relaxation and ease. And a life that is lived for comfort will evaporate like the mist, having achieved nothing. A truly wonderful life, a truly inspirational life, one that has really been lived, is a life that is spent in a worthy cause. So the question is, what worthy cause will you live for? Right now, all around you, there is evil and pain and ignorance. So what will you do about it? What ignorance can you instruct? What wrong can you redress? What misery can you alleviate? How can you glorify God and love others with your life? In eternity, that will be the only thing that will matter to you. Jesus Christ said, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. To love and glorify God and love others as yourself is the meaning of life. Anything worthwhile that you can achieve in life is centered around those two principles. If you find a way to glorify God and love others and commit your life to it, you will live. Jesus also told us, those who love their lives will destroy them, but those who care nothing for their lives in this world will keep it for eternity. His point being that if you search out safety and comfort and ease for love of this life, you will actually ruin it, you'll waste it, you'll miss what it's all about. But if you're ready to give it all for Christ, if you're ready to risk everything for the worthiest of causes, you will find the true meaning of life and you will have it forevermore. So again, the question is, how will you now live? What are you going to do? Before you commit to anything, count the cost. As soon as you pursue a life of meaning, you're going to come into trials and difficulties. You're going to be hated, you're going to be opposed, you're going to be rejected, you're going to struggle, you're going to encounter danger and risk. But those difficulties are fertile soil in which greatness can grow. As Charles Spurgeon said, most men owe the grandeur of their lives to tremendous difficulties. Even Paul wrote, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation, and this hope will not lead to disappointment. Trials and difficulties on the way to achieving your life's purpose are part of the process and will actually do you good. It will develop your character, and you do have a life's purpose. 
for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. God has planned good things for you to do with your life. Your life has meaning, but you just need to have the courage to live it, to leave behind your safety and security and comfort and step out in faith. Theodore Roosevelt said, It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error or shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the great deeds, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself for a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Everyone dies in the end. The tragedy is that not everyone really lives. Don't be one of them. If you're a Christian, your death isn't even really a death, it's just a transition to glory. So why cling to it and let fear stop you from doing things that should be done? Live gloriously, live for the kingdom. If you're chasing comfort, possessions, wealth and a life of ease, as most people are, you're simply throwing it away. All your possessions will die with you. Invest in the kingdom, store up riches in heaven, and then death will actually be a moment of glory because then you'll go to receive your inheritance. God has given us a cause and a command to go out and change the world, and he didn't promise that it would be easy, but he promised that it would be worthwhile. It's time we all got in the arena with its dust and sweat and blood and really started living. It's time that we, the church, really came alive. That's why this first kindling video must start here, because until we're ready for this change of mindset, until we're ready to abandon our comfort and ease and safety and risk it all for Christ, we can never really come truly alive. We can never truly be the church that Jesus wants us to be.